Uh, it's a real treat to uh, have Kent Friedman with us uh, today. Kent is the section chief of nuclear medicine at New York University. He's actually a native of the great state of Connecticut. He uh, left for a while and went to, to Vassar for his undergraduate degree in biochemistry and then came back to Connecticut for medical school at UConn. Uh, he went on to a nuclear medicine residency and PET-CT fellowship at the Johns Hopkins Hospital and later joined the faculty at NYU. Kent uh, is a real leader in nuclear medicine and we're thrilled to have him here today. He's going to talk about PET-MR. Dr. Friedman. Thank you very much for that introduction. I'd like to thank Dr. Saperstein and Dr. Geshwin for inviting me to give you this talk. <clears throat> PET-MR is becoming a really broad field already just over the past few years. I'm going to focus mainly on practical uh, uh, clinical applications and workflow for clinical PET-MR. Uh, I'd be happy to talk to you guys about research uh, after the talk, but I think there's a lot to cover as we think about how we're going to roll out um, PET-MR uh, as a clinical tool across the country and across the world. So I wanted to give you, you know, uh, a taste of our initial experience now over the past three years having a, having a PET-MR and spending 50% or more of the time on the machine for clinical patients. I'll touch briefly on PET-MR technology just to get everyone sort of on the same plate about uh, what we're talking about. And then I'll spend some time on workflow. I hope for Many of you that w this discussion about ad administrative aspects will be uh, at least somewhat interesting and pr of practical value. And then I'll spend the bulk of the talk talking about clinical applications, what we're what we're using uh, PetMR for, for already. I'm going to focus mainly on showing you what I think are pretty good case examples, and and not spend as much time uh, going over numbers in the literature. There's already a huge body of, of publications coming out about clinical applications, but I will stay focused on oncology and neurology. We aren't doing much cardiac PETMR yet. We probably will soon with ammonia uh, imaging. I'll touch on some pitfalls at the very end. So why are we talking about PETMR? What's wrong with PET-CT? Many of us have spent our careers using PET-CT and it was our most cutting edge tool and it's already very accurate. Why do we even want to think about a PETMR? Well, the answer is one way you could say, well, what are the limitations of PET-CT that MR uh, might help us improve on? So one of the big limitations is low soft tissue contrast on CT for certain organs that are very important, like the brain, the breast, the heart, the liver, the kidneys, and the bones. So if we can do better with a PET-MR in those organs, perhaps there'd be justification for the expense of the machine. We also learn as nuclear medicine physicians how to deal with all of the motion artifacts and misregistration due to PET-CT. You do a CT at the very beginning of your PET-CT and then you do these multi-bed acquisitions over time with PET. And it leads to motion artifacts and misregistration. So maybe we could do something better with MR motion correction. <clears throat> this is just an example of you know, bowel motility uh, problems where uh, on PET-CT you see a hot spot and there's nothing on that slice and a couple centimeters away there's actually a, or at least a centimeter away there's a bowel implant that moved between the CT and the time that the PET went through the pelvis. So maybe we could do better with simultaneous imaging with PET-MR. And then gating, you know, gated CT to do cardiac PET-CT is a pretty high radiation dose procedure because you have to do multiple CT acquisitions. So again, maybe we can leverage gated MR to improve uh, what we're doing for patients. <coughs> So I already mentioned improved lesion detection uh, in general, in a general sense, but I wanted to also emphasize that an advantage could be, uh, we know as radiologists and nuclear medicine doctors, in certain scenarios, you get much better delineation of tumor margins on uh, MR compared to CT in certain situations. So the T stage of tumors could be something, uh, you know, determining the T stage is something where combining PET with MR may, may help. Uh, in general, we think we can get better alignment, uh, which would help with lesion localization and quantification, and as I said, the reduced radiation exposure, um, especially in pediatrics, young adults with curable cancers, 
Um, and evaluation of other maybe non-malignant diseases in young patients, you can keep the radiation dose down. Now you can do a very low dose CT, but then you don't have very good anatomical information, whereas with Petamar you can get great anatomical information. And then down to more just purely practical advantages, not so exciting, but it's very convenient if you can do a PET and, and an MR exam in, say, one, one hour session and not have to schedule a patient for multiple visits. So our urologists are interested in prostate cancer staging where you do a prostate MR while you're waiting, while, you're, while the sodium fluoride is being taken up in the body, and then you do a PET MR of the whole body all in one session. Uh, breast cancer and lung cancer, there may be some applications, but we've been doing a lot in terms of patient convenience by doing uh, brain MRs and PETs at the same time for patients with cognitive impairment, uh, neurofibromatosis, and epilepsy. And then the big exciting research uh, concept is multi-parametric analysis of, of data. So with the PETMR, it's really the perfect tool to combine the best quantitative PET imaging with all of the uh, exciting things that are happening in MR um, to you know, hopefully uh, improve patient care. So and on the purely research level, with a simultaneous PETMR, we can do things like look at changes in receptor binding using PET radiopharmaceuticals and correlate that with real-time changes in functional MRI. Um, in oncology, we can use dynamic MR to derive tracer input functions to, uh, you know, model uh, delivery to tumors uh, as opposed to doing arterial line sampling. And by imaging simultaneously, there's some challenges to overcome, but it gives us the best opportunity to really do voxel-to-voxel -voxel correlations, and I'm sure your, your imaging research group um, has a full appreciation of how great it will be to be able to correlate um, uh, quantitative data across uh, multiple modalities in a very elegant fashion. Uh, cardiology, I think with gated MR, there's certainly opportunities there as well. So just briefly, I'll touch on system design for those of you that haven't had a chance to read about this. Um, one of the earliest systems was actually a PET-CT and an MR machine with a bed that could be moved between the two devices. So it wasn't really a PET-MR, but it was a pet -MR. It was a, a PET-CT and an MR with a fancy bed, and that, that does work pretty well, um, but it doesn't allow for simultaneous imaging. This is a similar design where there's one bed that doesn't move and it just translates between bores, but they're still essentially separate scanners. What I'm gonna focus on today is data acquired at our institution using the simultaneous PET-MR like the one, the one we have. Um, I think all the companies are working on having this sort of design where the PET detector is inside of the MR. But you know, the real advantage here is the ability to acquire all that data simultaneously. The disadvantage is uh, cost and complexity. What made it possible to have a PET detector ring inside of an MR was really the development of solid state technology. So this is a, something called an avalanche photodiode, which replaces the typical um, uh, photomultiplier tubes used uh, around a, a ring of crystals in a conventional PET detector. Uh, this is relatively insensitive to magnetic fields and again allowed for this simultaneous design. The main, uh, and then this is just a diagram of how with the, with the Siemens system, the PET detector is in between the RF body coil and the gradient coil, placed in there basically within a 3T MR. The next step is manufacturers are now putting even better detectors into the PET machines. There's something called a silicon photomultiplier, um, a little bit better than the avalanche photodiodes um, uh, from an engineering standpoint, and it allows for time of flight PET, so we'll get a little bit better quantification with these SIPMs. Um, this is our machine. It's a very massive piece of hardware, of course. Uh, let me just talk about protocols. So if you're thinking about getting a pet MR, you might wonder, well, how, how does this actually work compared to a PET CT? So the big difference is in a PET CT, you do a CT scan, and then you do chunks of PET beds. Um, with a pet MR, you do MR of a given area and PET of a given area all at the same time, and then you move to the next location, and then you do the same thing for another position, and so on and so forth. The simultaneous systems are quite flexible. You can acquire as many MR sequences you want for a given part of the body. You can scan with your PET detector for as long or as short as you want, um, but you go by chunks. Uh, 
a big, another big difference with PetMR compared to PetCT is how attenuation correction works. We use MR sequences to estimate um, uh, lung, soft, uh, soft tissue, fat, and um, air. And that's done using a Dixon sequence, which I won't go into detail, but um, it allows us to do a basic estimation of tissue density. It's not quite the gold standard that you get with a CT scan, but it gives you a pretty good attenuation correction map. There are newer atlas-based techniques that put this image together with an estimate of where the bone is in the body, and uh, they perform pretty well as well, uh, or even a little bit better. So again, data is acquired in chunks. So you might do a pet of the head with a several diagnostic MR sequences and then go through the chest, the abdomen, and so forth. And you can change whatever you want along the way. You can always do more MR sequences of one area if you see fit. And so it's really flexible. You can do other things like you can do you know, an area, a lot of extra additional MR sequences, and then go to another area and cut down. I guess that's sort of the same as what I just said, but very flexible. You can then, if you want, at the end, give contrast, gadolinium, and then go back and do post-contrast imaging of the body. You're not supposed to do Dixon MR with contrast on board, so it's better to do that at the very end. Um, but you can still get the data fused um, that way. And you can do the attenuation scans at the beginning of the study or also at the end as well in some cases. So I won't dwell on protocols too much, but it's, uh, it's, 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 uh, these are basic protocols that we've uh, arrived at that work pretty well for us. So for oncology, we do PET imaging combined with uh, radial vibe, diffusion, haste, and stir if we want to look at bone. Uh, that ends up being about six minutes per bed. Uh, for epilepsy, we do all sorts of stuff, ASL imaging, MP rage for anatomy, flare for inflammation. Um, and diffusion imaging as well to look for vascular problems. We acquire all these MR sequences during the uptake phase of the PET tracer, and then we use the data from the very end of the study to interpret our PET data. And then we do it, like for head and neck cancer, we do a diagnostic neck MR combined with very, uh, pretty long actually, PET acquisitions, but we get really good image quality, 15 minutes per bed. If the patient moves during that time, we can throw out some of the data and uh, reconstruct a shorter time point if we want. So I'll talk a little bit about clinical workflow, hopefully for those of you involved with um, your scheduling and um, radiology information system and billing and whatnot, this, this will be of some interest. Um, when we first started in our department, clinicians had to order a PET and order an MRI separately, which was always confusing. Now we have combined codes for our common clinical indications where the doctor can just order one thing and it's, it, it expands out and becomes an order for a diagnostic MRI and an order for a PET. They have to type in appropriate clinical indications for both a PET and an MR to order a PET MR for these uh, protocols that are combining a diagnostic MR with PET. Um, if they have a really less common but still clinically justifiable reason to do an exam, then uh, they still have to order a PET and an MRI separately. So this involves a lot of phone calls back and forth between scheduling the technologist and the physicians on duty. But we make it happen. We can't come up with combination codes for every single uh, combined exam under the sun. We just have the most common ones. So you know, some of our common exams are a PET MR with uh, FDG of the brain and then a brain MRI with or without volumetric analysis for dementia patients. Uh, combined with a breast MR, skull base to mid thigh combined with a breast MR. Um, for head and neck cancer patients, vertex to thighs, FDG PET with a neck MRI, so and so on and so forth. <clears throat> and then here's that sodium fluoride bone study with uh, prostate MR that our urologists asked for. We actually didn't have that idea. They came up with that and said, hey, we'd really like to do this, a quick way to stage patients quickly. And then, uh, uh, again, for those custom MR exams, we just went back and used the old PET codes that are, um, uh, were used before we had PET CT scanners, and we reactivated those codes in our system. And you know, for these unique requests, they place the order for the MR and place the order for the PET. Um, we make sure the insurance is sorted out as if they were having two separate exams, but we have it all done on the same scanner. And then we have billing research-only codes that don't bill the patient, but that's not too interesting to you, probably. 
I'm sure you have your own system to not bill patients accidentally for research, um, which unfortunately I think happens from time to time at some institutions. Um, okay, so what do you need to run the machine? I think you really need two technologists. Uh, you need at least one MR tech and one PET tech. Maybe they can be trained in both. Some of our nukes techs have gone and gotten trained in MR. I think it's uh, harder for the radiology techs to go back and then do a whole nuclear medicine training program in New York State, but uh, some may end up doing that, but we certainly have some of the nukes people going and getting the MR training. They can do a course that takes six or eight months and take an exam and get certified, and then they have on-the-job training. So um, you definitely need at least two techs to run these machines. Um, in terms of reading sessions, you, you're probably not surprised to hear that we have dual readers for most things. Um, at least now, while, while our radiologists and nuclear medicine physicians are learning uh, about this technology, we uh, read together, usually in the same room, and we make sure that the reports are fully integrated and there's no conflicts between, uh, uh, um, you know, what one person is saying and what another person is saying. I think that's one of the best things about the uh, combined report. We do sometimes phone calls when we don't have time to meet, but we try to meet in person whenever possible. So a um, couple times a week we meet uh, together for brain studies between the neuroradiologist and nuclear medicine physician. Oncology cases are usually read in, by the body radiologist and nuclear medicine doctor. Lately, the body MR person will dictate the case, and then the nuclear medicine physician looks at it, and it's a good opportunity for the fellows to learn, you know, to see more PET scans, the body fellows. And then if there's any disagreement, we'll have a phone call. So we do read those separately. The brains, we actually meet uh, together. And for pediatric cases, we also read together uh, in the same place. Um, I, I do think, of course, the future, we need to have single readers who are well-trained in both PET and MR. Um, my personal opinion is for people that are still, uh, people that have been trained in, in nuclear medicine, um, I think, I think nuclear medicine physicians can learn body MR well enough to do general oncology um, PET MR images like we've done for PET CT to read them. I think neuro is just so complicated. It's, you'd really have, you know, a, a nuclear medicine trained person would need some kind of fellowship to learn, I think, to read neuro uh, MR uh, uh, appropriately. But um, we're, we're pretty happy with the dual reads for now. and. Um, People that are dual certified occasionally will read them, read things on their own. But we like the, the camaraderie and the collegiality of reading together for now. And as long as we're not super, super busy, it seems to be working OK. I've alluded to this already, but you know we do one report for most pet MRs now. We clearly describe the pet findings in one section. We clearly describe the diagnostic MR findings in another section because we are billing. We're sending, you know, this is the report that's also used to bill for diagnostic MR. We clearly indicate that diagnostic MR was done in the technique. Um, and then uh, you know we have a unified report at the end. And it seems to be working pretty well. Um, you know, again, we bill for the two separate exams. We're very careful to document appropriate indications for both PET and MR in the history section of the report, since it'll be used for both, you know, bills uh, that are being submitted. In general, the reimbursement has been pretty good. I, I don't know if it's something in New York that is helping us, or our, our coders are really good, or maybe we're just okay because we have really strong indications for both PET and MR when we do these studies. But things have gone better than we thought they would. And um, you know, I think a lot of people feel the best approach in terms of Medicare is just to do PET MR when you have an indication, a strong indication for both exams. And um, Medicare has suggested that they will pay for PET MR exams if you really need a PET and you really need a diagnostic MR in patients. So I don't think we want to create bundled combo codes just yet. Um, we'll see. All right, so that's the overview of the nuts and bolts of the workflow. It's been a bit of a challenge, but we modeled a lot of what we do after the PET CT practice, and I think it's worked reasonably well. Um, I want to show you now the clinical cases. It looks, I think I have a half an hour now, so I'll try to finish a little, little um, early. But I want to show you just, you know, sort of bread and butter things. You know, what, what, uh, what are we achieving um, with clinical PET MR that is sometimes harder to achieve with 
with PET-CT. So in oncology, I just want to start with T staging, as I said. Um, I'm sure you, many and or all of you are aware of how MR has these advantages for delineating tumor margins in certain parts of the body. Um, so you certainly get that when you do a clinical oncological PET-MR for someone who has a big primary tumor. And then with the PET part, you get the persistent uh, you know, literature supported slightly better sensitivity for detection of subcentimeter lymph node metastases using FDG. Um, so this gives the referring physician a lot of information in one exam and it's more convenient for the patient. Pelvic and GI malignancies are an area where we've seen some benefit and then head and neck cancer is something we're starting to do, although that's more in the context of a research study. I think it may become a, a, a clinical routine. Here's a rectal cancer patient that had a pretty big uh, tumor, uh, very FDG avid, but on the PET-CT it looked like it was confined to the rectal uh, wall, at least not invading through the muscle. But with the better resolution of the MR here, you can see actually that the tumor was invading the, uh, or getting past the muscularis externa, and this, this upstages the tumor from uh, T2 to T3. So this is better. T staging of you know, an appropriately selected indication um, to get a little more detailed information. You can imagine with a bigger tumor, um, you know, uh, if there's a question about invasion of the pelvic sidewall or bones, uh, that could be helpful. Um, uh, gynecologic malignancies, you know, same concept. You get better T staging with the MR. Here's a large uh, 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 bladder, well, a, a urothelial carcinoma. Uh, in the pelvis, and you get very detailed, of course, delineation of the extent of the primary tumor on the, um, on the, on the, on the, on the MR. And then you get, uh, let's see, on the next slide, you can see very clearly some lymph nodes that were borderline pathologic by MR criteria, clearly shown to be metastatic on, on the FDG PET images. So again, I mean, you could do a PET CT and an MR um, separately, but this is a nice quick uh, exam for patients and easy to read and brings your different subspecialists together to work together. And um, I think, you know, it's a good exam. A lot of people talk about the fact that a PET MR wouldn't be your first PET scanner. It might be your fourth scanner or your fifth scanner. If you look at how many people get PET-CT and MR um, around the same time within a couple of weeks, those are your individuals who you're going to serve with a clinical PET-MR right off the bat as we develop more applications. Here's again T-staging of a, of a tongue carcinoma. Uh, hard to see much anatomical detail on the PET-CT over here, but on the PET-MR, um, this patient's on a research protocol, but on the PET-MR, you can clearly see the tumor delineated very nicely here and the extent of invasion into the tongue base. And you can check for bone uh, invasion as well um, with the MR. And then you also have your you know, metabolic information to look for lymph node metastases, which were present on this patient um, enlarged. Uh, you, you could see it on the PET-CT, but you can see it even, even better on the STIR MR. Um, here's a buccal carcinoma, again, where you can leverage the MR to really see the tumor margins and correlate your metabolic activity with sites of tumor in the oral cavity and uh, increase your certainty uh, that this lesion, you know, is, is resectable. Although this patient did have lymph node metastases here. You can see if you look at the pixel size here, it's quite high resolution on the system we have. You have very nice detail. And one of our researchers, Dr. Kim, is trying to correlate these areas of PET uptake with, with um, a dynamic contrast enhanced MR, you know, advanced quantification parameters as well as uh, more advanced diffusion imaging to see if uh, we can better uh, diagnose lymph node metastases since although PET is quite good, it's still not perfect for finding lymph node metastases and there are false positives. Here's again just an example of the kind of resolution you can get with a PET MR for a tongue-based cancer um, here as well. Okay, so that's t hopefully I've at least somewhat convinced you that you can get better T staging with PETMR of patients with fairly, you know, moderate to advanced primary tumors. There could be some value there. And now I want to talk about just better metastasis detection. So we've seen, you know, in some percentage of patients, not a huge percentage, but definitely in some patients, 
we have seen um, you know, better detection and localization of metastases with PETAMAR compared to PET-CT. When we first got the machine, we had a, a research study where patients getting a PET-CT could go and get a PETAMAR right afterwards for free. And so a lot of these cases are from that study. Um, so I want to just show you. So this was a patient with endometrial cancer who had already been treated but came back with a rising tumor marker. And I'm sure those of you that read PET-CT understand this conundrum where you see a spot in the pelvis or somewhere in the peritoneal cavity, and you're saying to yourself, what is that? Is it a ureter that's been displaced by treatment, surgery, fibrosis? Is it a lymph node? Is it bowel? Is it just normal bowel or bowel inflammation? Is it a diverticulum? And there are these lesions that pop up in challenging areas um, where even with a pretty good quality uh, CT, you have some trouble. And uh, in this case, you know, we weren't quite sure what this intense uptake was fusing with, and the patient had rising tumor markers, so we really were on a quest to find what was going on, uh, find, find the cause of the tumor markers. And uh, uh, I, perhaps, I hope you'll agree that on the, the MR images, you could clearly see that this actually was a metastatic lymph node with restricted diffusion on, on ADC and um, you know, uh, 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 right there, a hot spot in the pelvic sidewall. It wasn't the ureter, it wasn't bowel. Uh, it really was a lesion, and it, it was unlikely to be urine with that low ADC there. And fortunately, in the pelvis, there's not a lot of misregistration, so we were pretty confident that that spot on the diffusion imaging was, in fact, the same thing that was FDG avid uh, and bright. So, you know, leveraging the added value of diffusion imaging certainly helps you out in certain situations. Here was a, 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 a PET lesion that was really kind of in this area that's tough to evaluate. Is it the liver? Is it the lung base? Is it the pericardium? Uh, is it the esophagus? What is that? And you don't see a correlate on CT. Um, and on the MR, though, with all these different sequences, there was a lot of motion on the diffusion imaging. But on the radial vibe, we saw a liver metastasis. Um, you know, with a good contrast CT, you might see that, but you might not. And we, you know, we were able to leverage the, uh, maybe there's a little controversial, but slightly higher sensitivity with, with MR compared to even contrast CT for detection of liver <coughs> metastases. This was a head scratcher, a history of sarcoma. We could not see, I mean, it was non-contrast study, so maybe with a high-res uh, contrast CT, we would have seen something. Um, but, you know, not all cancer patients can get contrast. Uh, um, there was something near the pancreas, but we couldn't tell what that was. Granted, there were METs elsewhere, so maybe management wasn't changed, but with diffusion imaging, you could clearly see that there were small metastases involving the pancreas, probably peritoneal implants on the pancreas, although I guess they could be hematogenous uh, spread to the pancreas as well. But you could clearly see tumor deposits with restricted diffusion that you just couldn't see on the PET-CT. So we're better able to say where those things were. Um, you know, despite being, in addition to being able to see lesions, we have observed and shown in this paper in AJR that l registration between the PET and the MR sequences is overall on average better than what you get with a PET-CT, probably because you're scanning much closer in time than when you do a CT scan and then do multiple beds over a long period of time. So we showed that lesions were localized within about two millimeters most of the time on PETAMAR, whereas within PET-CT they were localized within about four millimeters. So a little bit better image registration, which we certainly like to see. This is a little incremental you know, improvement. So I think, I think PETAMAR is all about lots of little incremental improvements. It might not be a huge paradigm shift like we saw going from PET to CT, PET-CT, where you could finally see what lesions were, you know, were or where they were, but incremental benefits in a lot of different ways. This was a patient with thyroid cancer who had a positive iodine spec CT, but no lesion visible on CT in the sternum. And then on the PETAMAR, you could clearly see um, there, was, there was a little uh, metastasis in the sternum. <clears throat> we didn't prove this with biopsy. Um, I'm not aware of any benign bone lesions that can concentrate radioiodine, things like cysts and inflammatory soft tissue structures can give you a false positive, but we were pretty sure this was a bone met. What about lung nodules? So this is the question everybody, everyone asks, well, PET MR is not good, MR is not good for the lung, so we shouldn't use it on oncology patients. And I think that's a reasonable concern, but we have to think about 
I think the real question is, is how much do you gain from MR in, outside of the lung versus how much do you lose you know, in the lung? And, and you have to answer that question by thinking about your population of patients and the types of cancer. So a pediatric patient with osteosarcoma probably needs surveillance with chest CTs. Um, but a, a young patient with lymphoma where little lung nodules are usually not clinically relevant is probably fine to be followed with PETAMAR. So I think the question about PETAMAR being bad for lung nodules depends on, you know, what types of patients you're talking about. Here's a PET CT showing about a five millimeter lung nodule in the right lower lobe that's FDG avid. And then here on the MR, uh, I think this is a radial vibe. You know, yeah, you don't see that lesion quite as well. So we're worried about missing things under five millimeters. Um, we published this a couple of years ago, looking at uh, patients, uh, general population of oncology patients using the radial vibe MR, which is a very motion robust sequence and pretty good for lung nodules. And we found um, of, of patients that had any lung nodule seen on the CT part of the PET CT, MR picked up 82% of them. 83% of them were FDG avid. And in general, we, if we assume an FDG avid spot is a nodule, even if you can't see it on MR, PETMR picked up 89% of nodules. The sensitivity for nodules below five millimeters was really, really low though. So we, we did miss the, the five millimeter nodules. Now, MR sequences are getting better and better, but they probably won't catch up to CT just yet. So is this clinically relevant? How does this compare to the advantages, like I said, in other organs? So in a follow-up study, my colleague, Dr. Rad, looked at all 200 patients that volunteered for our, our PET-CT to PET-MR study, and he found um, that uh, uh, there were there were 89 uh, nodules in 43 patients that were missed on the PET-MR. But if you looked at subsequent follow-up, only 3% of those nodules actually progressed in a fashion of that was compatible with progressive cancer. 97% of the nodules were either stable inflammatory uh, lesions or they improved and they were inflammatory lesions or cancer that responded to therapy and didn't change management. So, you know, you have to compare this data to the, to the advantages outside of uh, the lungs to really make a final judgment. But, you know, there are s certainly patients that are gonna need, a, if you decide to switch to PETMR, you might need a periodic CT scan in them as well for the near future. But uh, more broadly, does, you know, does PETMR change management? We have a little literature coming out now. You know, what is the overall value? I can talk about these, in a, you know, these cases I've selected to show you, but you know, what's the overall value? I think we need large multi-institutional studies, but some things are coming out. There was a paper in radiology by Catalano that suggested that if you did a PET-CT and then a PET-MR, that the PET-MR changed management in 18% of patients. I, I don't believe this. I don't think it's that good. I don't think it's that much better than PET-CT. 18% um, of the time seems like an awful lot. Drezga came to the conclusion that there was no significant difference compared to PET-CT, and so this probably has to do with patient population differences and how you classify changes in management. Our, when we started looking at this question, at most the, there were clinically relevant additional findings five to 10% of the time. Um, real changes in patient management were relatively rare. Um, so I think it's a better technique for some patients. It's going to change your management once in a while. It won't be a huge paradigm shift like PET-CT versus PET, but, um, you know, it, it, if you want, you know, want a PET-MR, I think, think PET-MR will play a role in departments as one of, you know, many scanners, and there are some advantages in these carefully selected patients like gynecologic malignancies. Um, we do get these occasional studies where we pick up occult liver, brain, bone, or peritoneal metastases that were missed on the PET-CT. Um, so we'll see. The clinicians certainly like ordering these tests. It's more convenient, and I think it's a little bit better than PET-CT in certain situations. And I'll be curious to s if anyone wants to talk after the lecture about that, if you agree with, with me or not. So we'll shift gears and talk about neuro applications. It looks like I'm going to try to finish in about 20, 25 minutes, so I think we're okay on time. Um, neurology, so let's start with dementia. 
this is this and epilepsy has really been our two most successful areas with the PETAMAR. The neurologists are very interested in, 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 in having a, a PETAMAR on their patients with cognitive impairment. I think uh, it's convenient for the patients. A lot of the, these individuals um, you know, are demented or somewhat demented and have trouble. Um, you know, it's hard for them to go through multiple appointments. It's certainly convenient for the patients and then the uh, the, the, the combined read where uh, a very interested neuroradiologist and a very interested nuclear medicine physician sit down together to look at these cases, I think they really appreciate that. And we generate a lot of key images correlating findings that we push to PACS so that they can see the subtle MR finding and see the subtle PET finding. And uh, I think sort of a lot of different things have come together so that they really like these, these exams. Um, patients probably appreciate that they're getting you know, sort of a high-tech exam read by two very interested parties. So independent of the actual hardware technology, I think just what it's done for our workflow um, has been one of the advantages of having the machine. Um, as I said, it's convenient. I think, again, there's a, there's a growing perception that the details provided by MR combined with the joint reads uh, enhances everybody's understanding of the patient situation and especially the referring physician. It's also prompted a dementia conference where we all get together and look at cases together, which has been quite helpful. So that's a really nice side effect of PETAMAR is how it's brought people together from different parts of our department and also um, brought, uh, you know, given us something exciting to share with our referring physicians that they can then be involved with and help us with as well. Um, I've already talked about these things in a more general sense, but really for the patients with cognitive impairment, the convenience is nice. We can now correct for motion. Um, uh, a lot of cognitively impaired patients have trouble staying still, even in the head, head holder. And I think with the joint read, we really get the best assessment of the overall picture for the patient. And we can often find you know, multiple pathological processes in the brain at the same time with PETAMAR and give the referrer a comprehensive overview of what's going on. Um, perhaps the accuracy is going to be higher. Um, you know, for less common dementias as we learn more about how to put this information together. I feel that despite some differences in attenuation correction that the image quality with PETAMAR has been quite good in the brain. Um, we felt that although the attenuation correction is still being optimized, that visual interpretations are quite good with PETAMAR compared to PET-CT. Um, there is some generalized under, I'm sure the brain researchers who are are here who are watching this um, know that there's some undercorrection of counts around the outside of the brain near the bone um, with the first generation clinical scans, but uh, we have new ways of estimating where the bone is that are really helping with quantification. Um, we do all our MR imaging for about an hour. We acquire list mode PET for cognitively impaired patients, and we reconstruct the last 20 minutes. We do pretty standard things, uh, anatomic imaging with MP rage, look for inflammation and white matter abnormalities with flare, uh, diffusion imaging for vascular disease, susceptibility weighted imaging helps us find amyloid angiopathy. Here's our first patient who had a PET CT and then a PET MR. You know, slight differences in contrast, but generally the appearance is the same. When you do 3D volume rendering, you can see the PET CT on the top looks a little darker in the areas that are hypometabolic, whereas the PETAMAR looks a little different. There's slight differences, probably not that different than if they were being scan a patient was being scanned on different PET CT scanners. Um, here's some case examples. So I want to talk about how, in my opinion, sometimes the PETAMAR is synergistic, where we detect findings that would have been missed on PET CT. Uh, where our cert diagnostic certainty is increased when there's a mild, subtle finding on PET or MR that you're not sure about calling. And then I also want to show how we can pick up multiple diagnoses, um, you know, quickly in one comprehensive exam and one comprehensive report. Um, this is a man who had uh, either frontotemporal dementia or Alzheimer's um, clinically, had uh, temporal lobe hypometabolism on the PET-CT. And you can see some anatomical detail, but this is our routine sort of low dose CT. It's not great for looking for atrophy. Um, this looked like probably an Alzheimer's pattern on, on the PET images, although the occipital lobe may be a little down, but 
Um, and maybe the precuneus isn't as down as you would want it to be, but it was thought to be probably Alzheimer's. But what was nice about the PET-MR compared to the PET-CT is we immediately saw that there was a lot of white matter disease that may be contributing to the patient's condition. And he actually had an acute infarct. He was on anticoagulation for cardiac disease, and we, we picked that up. Uh, and then we also picked up on the SWI imaging that he had angeloid amyloid angiopathy characterized by these small uh, signal dropouts on SWI, and the patient was taken off of anticoagulation. Um, you know, not everybody with amyloid um, disease and Alzheimer's has amyloid angiopathy, so it was important to identify that in this patient. Um, this was someone who had hydrocephalus, was falling a lot. The, pets, the PET images looked like just typical Alzheimer's with frontotemporal and um, parietal hypometabolism, probably AD. Uh, the MR showed hydrocephalus, but then a neuroradiologist thought, you know, I think there's some midbrain atrophy here with the morning glory sign and the hummingbird sign. Could this patient have PSP, progressive supranuclear palsy? And when we went and looked at the um, PET images, actually the cardiac lobes were quite hypometabolic. Um, then the question was, well, could this be from hydrocephalus? And the only literature I could find was that hydrocephalus causes a generalized reduction in an FDG uptake in the brain, but nothing regional. So we concluded that um, this was probably someone who has progressive supranuclear palsy. The caudate lobes and the frontal lobes were, just in, um, in, were, were hypometabolic, but there was also you know, a suggestion of an Alzheimer's pattern. So he may have two dementias at the same time as well as you know, hydrocephalus, so possibly three diagnoses. Um, this was a patient with clinically suspected Alzheimer's, has uh, marked left temporal atrophy on the MR images, knife blade atrophy, um, some parietal atrophy. Um, and um, uh, this is really, uh, uh, so th this kind of pattern is usually on MR read as uh, uh, semantic dementia due to frontotemporal lobar degeneration. Um, the PET did show a little parietal hypometabolism, but the predominant pattern here was the severe anterior temporal atrophy and anterior temporal hypometabolism. So we thought this was probably, uh, again, an FTD subtype and not AD, um, although we, you know, we could discuss whether or not this patient needed amyloid imaging as well. But uh, the atrophy pattern being so suggestive on MR, I think, informed the PET interpretation, hopefully in the right direction. Um, so some examples of increasing diagnostic confidence. This is a patient with word finding difficulty, had a little bit of uh, left parietal atrophy, but really had severe asymmetric left uh, temporal parietal and occipital hypometabolism. It's probably a case of PPA. Um, which the logopenic variant, which is associated with amyloid disease. But um, again, the, the, the MR atrophy helped us with the interpretation that this was probably a dementia and not some kind of other injury to the left cerebrum. Uh, sometimes the PET wins alone. You never know what you're going to get with a brain PET MR. So sometimes the MR shows nothing and the PET quote unquote wins, if you want to look at it that way. This was someone with memory loss, a little bit of parietal atrophy, but not nothing diagnostic of a dementia syndrome. The temporal lobe looked pretty good. And then the hippocampus was a little small on one side. Again, not really totally diagnostic. Uh, but the PET really showed pretty striking left temporal hypometabolism. So you can see here that the PET is preceding atrophy uh, in, in some patients at least, um, wh you know, where you'll get a drop in the FDG uptake before you get a detectable atrophy pattern. And so, um, you know, our, our neuroradiologist was impressed by this because it really looks like an AD, you know, temporal parietal hypometabolism, um, uh, which was not so apparent on MR. And here was the 3D projection of that. As much as we think that reading these cases together, you know, the MR and the PET part together informs our findings and makes us better, sometimes it does have us scratching our heads, though. So I'd like to show you this as an idea for you know, what we need to do for future uh, research, combining MR data with PET data. Sometimes no one wins in these cases. This was a young patient with language and memory difficulty, so already an unusual situation given their age. Um, there was sort of a nonspecific pattern on the PET part, a little temporal 
uh, hypometabolism on the left, mild to moderate, maybe a little parietal hypometabolism. You wouldn't be ready to say this patient has Alzheimer's. The precuneus looked okay. The hippocampus looked all right on both sides, which is typical for early onset Alzheimer's. That wasn't really helpful in terms of narrowing our differential diagnosis. But the atrophy pattern on the MR was quite severe, frontal and parietal. And so the atrophy was worse than the hypometabolism in this case. So is this an FTD or is this some kind of unusual Alzheimer's? Um, you know, the, 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 the MR would have been read as suspicious for FTD. The PET would have been read as either nonspecific or maybe early Alzheimer's. And, uh, you know, maybe this patient needs an amyloid scan. But, you know, since the IDEA study is only for Medicare patients, uh, they won't be able to get an amyloid scan just yet. But, you know, this was a vexing situation, so it didn't solve our problem. It, if they had just had one scan or the other, they would have arrived, a PET CT or an MR, there would have been two different diagnoses rendered. Maybe it's better to, maybe it's better to tell the clinician that it's nonspecific so they can look for other things. Um, this was a patient, 82, with uh, memory loss, gait difficulties, a little mild parietal hypometabolism, not really specific. Um, hippocampus was normal, hippocampi were normal, but there was this severe frontal and insular atrophy, which would have been read as suspicious for FTD. Meanwhile, the PET was pretty normal, um, uh, or maybe mild AD. So again, uh, uh, we didn't get the answer here. It would be interesting to get an amyloid scan on this patient. So we have a lot to learn about characterizing these dementias. MR and PET findings probably don't always become abnormal in the exact same temporal sequence in every patient, and we have to sort out the differences, but I think PETMR is a good tool to do that kind of research. We're doing some amyloid imaging. The IDEA study where Medicare will pay for amyloid PET in some patients is coming along. Um, you know, we don't do too much of this yet because of the reimbursement challenges, but uh, I think with the IDEA study, we're going to be doing more of these amyloid PETMRs. There's always concern, again, about quantification of amyloid with um, PETMR, um, but there's some research to suggest that although there are quantitative differences, the reads are the same visually. So the IDEA study has decided it's okay to use PETMR for their study. So I guess they believe this kind of preliminary research that even though there's some quantitative differences, you can get decent clinical visual reads out of a PETMR. Um, I'm, you know, I probably have five minutes or so left, so I'll just quickly show you some epilepsy cases. I may skip a few of these, but epilepsy is the other area where things have really taken off. We did very little epilepsy PET imaging in my training and for many years at NYU, but when the PETMR came along, everyone got really interested in it. And I just want to show you some cases. Um, you know, it's a difficult patient population. We're a referral center where we get a lot of extratemporal epilepsy uh, patients, uh, and it's a real challenge for the clinicians. And as you know, they do all sorts of things, EEG, surgically placed grids, um, lots of clinical evaluations to localize seizures. So when we got the PETMR, the neurologist thought, let's start sending some patients and see what we get. Um, I'm going to skip a few of these things. Uh, I just want to show you some case examples. So uh, I think one example is PET can show some abnormalities that are subtle or invisible on MR. Um, this is a patient uh, with complex partial seizures, um, suspicious right-sided focus on video EEG, but a normal MR through the hippocampi and the temporal lobes. And then the PET showed us about this 5 to 10 percent reduction in the right temporal lobe that fit with the EEG findings. So I think this is a case where PET shows you uh, subtle uh, abnormalities that are not picked up on the MR. So I was pleased to see this because I, you know, again, during my training, I didn't really get to see PET helping in the, in the you know, comprehensive workup of these patients, but I think they, the referrers are very happy when we can localize an area of injury like that that was not seen on MR. Um, I'll show some more examples. This patient had a slightly funny appearance to the left uh, hippocampus, and I apologize for not being a neuroradiologist, but a little flattening of the hippocampus. Uh, maybe a focal lesion, but then generalized left hemispheric injury. So this patient probably wouldn't benefit from a, um, you know, focal surgical procedure in the medial temporal lobe. But um, we have to understand better, and I 
would love to hear from any of you that have experience in epilepsy, you know, how to reconcile focal MR findings with generalized PET findings. But the PET MR is certainly a good way to um, do more research in this area. Um, here's a case where MR highlighted subtle findings on PET. Little, at, at first glance, this PET might not be too exciting looking, but then there's some focal cortical dysplasia here in the, uh, near the lateral ventricle, and there's actually some corresponding hypometabolism out at the periphery of the brain. And again, the focal lesion on MR has projections, you know, probably functional connections that go out to the edge of the brain here. And, uh, you know, what does this tell us? Well, it tells us there's some injury out here. I don't know what it means in terms of how much brain should be removed, but it's certainly um, interesting having all this data together at the same time. Here was a little, uh, I'm just going to go quickly here, but that was just a little um, encephalo seal here. This PET was originally read as normal, the PET data, and then we saw the encephalo seal and went back and said, you know what, there's a little gray matter abnormality in the medial temporal lobe there. We would have just missed that completely had the MR not uh, pointed us in the right direction. You can see it on the 3D projection as well, some hypometabolism. Um, so sometimes PET finds things, and sometimes MR finds things that we don't see on PET. So this is a totally normal FDG image in an epilepsy patient, but there's left occipital horn gray matter heterotopia um, that just did not yield any peripheral abnormalities on the PET. So this is very likely the cause of the patient's seizures, but it was not causing changes in gray matter metabolism. Uh, and, um, you know, therefore, in this case, the PET showed you, I mean, the MR showed what was going on and the PET didn't. So, again, you never know what you're going to get when you do a PET MR, but you often get something that I would argue is clinically useful on one or both modalities. And then again, like I showed in the epilepsy case, we have discordant findings. I think the question is, does this alter management for the better or for the worse? I don't have the answer yet, but this was a, a patient, uh, you know, with encephalitis, epilepsy, normal EEG, and the neuroradiologist felt that the right hippocampus was flattened and T2 hyperintense on MR, but the PET part showed left temporal injury that we were pretty confident about. So this patient does not have a lateralizing uh, PET MR, and this likely changes management, hopefully for the better. Um, all right, so we're almost done. I'll just show you a few pitfalls for a minute, and then I'll conclude. So I think hopefully we're on time. Um, you know, Petamar has some challenges. We're still deal dealing with metal artifacts, uh, motion blurring as we improve the, the gating and attenuation correction algorithms. The uh, large field of view when you're doing a whole body MR means that resolution in certain structures is still can be limited compared to, say, a focused spine MR or a focused uh, pancreatic MR. There's spatial distortion on the diffusion imaging that we need to find ways to correct um, in a more routine way without doing fancy uh, research, pro uh, you know, offline processing. Um, currently, well, some of the PET MR simultaneous scanners don't have time of flight, although I think there's a manufacturer that does have that silicon photo multiplier. Um, so, uh, you know, we would like to have time of flight. We don't on our machine, but. That's probably not a huge deal, but would be nice to have better quantification. The data sets are huge, um, which is a little bit laborious, although I have to say our IT department has done a good job handling the data sets, um, and so it hasn't been too much of a challenge lately. These are the kind of dropout artifacts you can get from metallic clips, which are challenging. It leads to errors in the attenuation correction maps, which leads to dark spots on your PET images. Um, you know, we're just still in the early stages of this technology. I think this stuff will be better handled in the future. Actually, already, you know, here's that hole in the PET image that you got from metallic clips, which is challenging since you want to look for local recurrence, maybe near a surgical site in a patient. Um, but newer algorithms are starting to recognize things like hip prostheses and automatically fill in the mu map with just soft tissue density. So I think we'll see continued improvements there. Um, where the attenuation correction gets better and better. I'm not that worried about it. I mean, this was a bad artifact where a big a pacemaker caused a hole in the lung which affected the lung segmentation. But again, the software is getting better at recognizing these problems. Uh, also, like nodules in the lungs that don't exist. Again, these are all growing pains of a first-generation clinical scanner, and I think most of these problems are going to be solved. Um, you know, I've already commented on future 
developments, respiratory gating, cardiac gating, motion tracking, better segmentation. But I think these things are all achievable very, in the very near future and will enhance our practice. So um, let me just conclude by saying I think Petamar technology is here to stay for sites that can you know, have a Petamar as their third or fourth hybrid imaging machine. Um, or maybe if you have four PET CTs, your next one could be a Petamar. I think it's a good tool. Um, we're already using it clinically for all these indications listed below. Um, not so much pediatrics um, because we don't have sedation capabilities at our center, but patient, pediatric kids that can stay still, we are imaging them on the Petamar. And I guess I've already talked about the advantages, so I won't talk too much more about the lesion detectability and the convenience. But you know, it has a lot of small advantages or small to moderately Good, great advantage, moderately good advantages that when you add them all up, I think it's a useful um, tool. Uh, you know, the ultimate broad scale public health level impact on patient management compared to cost, of course, is still controversial, but we think we're seeing benefits clinically already. And um, it's exciting to see where we can go with research using the PETAMAR as a tool to facilitate, you know, multi parametric al analysis of molecular and anatomical data. Um, and you know, hopefully it will play a role in personalized medicine and bioinformatics research in the future. Thank you very much.